the South Asian, Swedish South Asian Studies Network and the Lund University's Human Geography Department. And today we're bringing you one of the most prominent scholars in the field of development. And I guess many of you don't need an introduction as well, but Dr. Vandana Desai is with us today. And she is uh, a senior lecturer in Development Geography at the Department of Geography, Royal Holloway University of London. And she will give the lecture <coughs> today on her recent paper entitled Slum Speculation and Aging in India. But I see yeah. you have already changed the title. <laughs> Slum Speculation and Aging New Forms of Marginal Marginality and Exclusions. Uh, Vandana Desai is also the co-author of the book that we use in our program, Companion to Development Studies, with uh, Robert. Robert Potter. Yes. And uh, I guess we are all excited to listen to the lecture now, so the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and it's always nice when, when students invite you. Other colleagues in It's not that it's not nice when other colleagues in one, but it is always fruitful and quite satisfying as a, as a lecturer to get it from some other university who has given you read your work and want you to come and give a talk. So it's always an honor and always, you know, a sense of glow, a uh, sense of warmth, you know, when you feel when somebody invites you because they want to see your work. So um, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, what I'm presenting today is, is a work in progress. It's something which I sort of wrote a theoretical paper on with Alex Loftus um, about two years ago, uh, which, which came out in Antipode on slum speculation. And it's work that I have been working uh, in the context with lots of non-governmental organizations. But some of you who follow my work um, know that you know, I've worked with lots of different types of non-governmental organizations. And recently I've been working a lot with practical action and water aid. And their programs are basically in the context of um, providing infrastructural services like water and sanitation to slum communities so that environmentally slum communities have a better life uh, and also, uh, you know, it, it's, as we're looking towards sustainable development goals, you know, we're looking at pollution, hygiene, sanitation issues uh, within slums, which are very densely packed in South Asia. So, so you know, it, these, these main two NGOs are, are sort of quite into providing those infrastructural facilities in, in slums as well. So working with them was where we started looking at how provision of services was contributing to slum life and what were the consequences of you know, providing these infrastructure. And part of it was that we realized that as services were being put in, uh, the prices, the rental prices, as well as the housing prices were going up and up and up. And the people so, um, so to, to come back to it is, is that though that paper was very much talking about slum speculation in a very theoretical context, we never looked at people and how people were facing the consequences of slum speculation. So this paper is very much looking at one particular section, which is of course the aging population within slums and how they are getting marginalized and excluded from urban spaces and, and what are the consequences of them because of how real estate politics takes place in the city itself. So um, the picture is my college. So if you have never seen Valhalloway, uh, it's a beautiful chateau, it's a French chateau. Um, and it's a red brick uh, in a very serene location. So it's, it's, it's exactly like Lund in some sense, you know, very quiet. Uh, in a smaller place away from the busy city of London, about 20, you know, about 40 minutes on the train, um, but very close to Heathrow Airport. So, so you know, you're most welcome sometime to visit it. So this this was a, a a quote which really attracted my attention to this whole debate on slum speculation in itself. Uh, th this came in the Times of India, uh, talking about real estate markets within slums. Most of you have heard about Dharavi in Mumbai. Most of my research, as you know, is in Mumbai, and I've worked in slum communities, or various slum communities in Mumbai for the last 20, 25 years. 
So I, I sort of have a lot of historical anecdotes to tell you also about as we go along in this paper, but also because of the, the areas that I grew up with in some sense. Uh, so I've seen them grow in itself. So this quote is by somebody called um, Apu Durai, who is, um, who is who's of course uses a lot of slum literature in itself. Uh, but the quote is done, somebody who said it is, 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 a, is a president of the Slum Federation, National Slum Federation in India. And the quote basically is, the real estate market is booming in Mumbai, but not in its traditional posh, suburban, or newly developing pockets. It is flourishing in the teen slums that have 60% of the city's population. And that is exactly the real basic premise of this of this paper, that it's not happening in the peripheries, it's not happening where there is space, it's happening in the dense parts of the city in itself, in everyday life, in everyday, um, that's in, you know, everyday communities that reside in these slums in itself. And Mumbai is no, no different city to any other international city or any other global south, southern city in the world today, because it looks at its role within how it wants to play within India. It sees as its uh, you know, Shanghai of China. It wants to be an international hyper financial capital of India. Uh, it sees its more modernization role, its international internationalization role within the context of India. As you know, it's a financial capital within India itself. So it has a lot of money. It has a lot of billionaires who live there as well. And so it, it always has this very cosmopolitan idea. Uh, as I grew up in Mumbai, there was a quote that was always said about it. It's like saying, what happens in Mumbai today will happen in the rest of India tomorrow. So it was very much that sort of an idea that this is a cosmopolitan city which leads the way of its fame of how India will be in the future. And as the city has grown into its millions and millions of population, and as it's become more commercial and, and, and enterprising, it's of course adopted a lot of you know, privatization and market driven political agenda to build infrastructure, housing, and it's it of course being a financial capital that sees a lot of that money being invested in the different types of luxurious living and so on and so forth. So in the last, you know, since liberalization in 1990 almost in the last 20 years, it's seen a, a proliferation of development that has taken place in the city because it wants the mega highways, the expressways, the links, the metros. Uh, in between, if you went in the last five or six years in Mumbai, it, you know, it was called the dig city. The dig city because everything was dug up. Every corner was dug up because they were putting the hyper cables for networks, cable networks. Uh, you know, for internet access, you know, telephone cables were being dug up, metro lines were being put, you know, there was uh, railway lines that were being put in. So everything was happening to make the city a very attractive place where commercial investments can take place. So it has, of course, led to a lot of transformation in the city in the context of land prices, uh, public investments, private investments, huge amount of private investment from abroad, even people from you know, Europe and London and so on and so forth are investing in London, in, in Mumbai because <coughs> it is in some sense a bigger capital in towards or the gateway towards India in itself. So it's an investment in lots of mega projects by firms here but also by for commercial reason in itself. So infrastructural development in the city has taken place a lot and that has also led to different types of spaces. Of course there is a city for the rich and a city for the poor, and, and both sit simultaneously together in itself. So you know, the paper very much is looking at this production of space. You know, and it's looking at how these speculative processes of land have developed in the last 20 years. But also about how little we know about this process. We talk about urbanization, we talk about density of population, we talk about slum communities, we all know about Dharavi. Uh, everybody has seen Slum Dog Millionaire. <coughs> yes, so uh, you know, everybody knows everything there is to know about Mumbai. But in many cities, this, this speculation is taking place. But somehow we don't want to accept it, or somehow we have not understood the processes that are taking place at the very grassroots level. And of course, as 
the housing prices change or as the land prices change, the rental process has also changed. So the relationship between landlords and, and rentals also changes as, as well. So there is this whole cycle that takes place which we are not perhaps uh, concentrating on. We're not looking at the process of change that's taking place in itself. And in, uh, within this context, I'd like you or I'd urge you to go back and look at David Howe's book, The Limits of Capital. I don't know if anybody has read. Of course, he's a Marxist geographer who writes in a very left-wing manner, not something which many people like uh, in these days in itself. But he makes one interesting argument in that book, and that's something which holds this paper together. Is that about the primary circulation of capital and how that leads to the secondary circles of capital? So we always know about primary circles because we invest, you know, we always think about our entrepreneurial activities and we always invest for profits. And cities see themselves as commercial places which are for investments and for, for progress and development in itself. And so we see that primary investments takes place, we speculate on our economic growth and that primary flow of capital brings us certain types of development either in the private sector or in the public sector in itself. But what we're not looking at, and this is something this paper again tries to look at, is the secondary sources of capital circulation that takes place. It's moving that primary capital, how that primary capital then influences the secondary flow of financial capital within the city in itself. And so very much using the David Harvey's, um, Harvey's work, this paper is very much trying to look at the secondary flow of capital. And that secondary flow of capital really <coughs> outlines some of the objectives that this paper wants to outline. So first is basically it's trying to look at how fragmentation of power takes place. How, how that secondary flow of capital brings about an influence in those communities and how those communities make decisions that then influence their lifestyles, the way they live, and how they do their everyday living. So basically, the research is trying to look at this growing fragmentation that is taking place at the grassroots level because of these financial flows that are taking place. It then goes on to sort of highlight some of the spatial politics of land claims that come about because of processes of speculation, but also because of speculation, some people do get displaced some people cannot compete in that environment and so they are pushed out or displaced from those localities in itself. And of course then that brings the question into how secure are these people uh, in these slum communities in their housing in itself. You know, I don't know if you have read, but you, have you read the DeSato's argument? Yes. Have you been looking at low-income housing? Uh, you know, DeSato has always argued that you, you need to have security of tenure. It's one of the rights that you know, some communities should have. That once you provide people a security of tenure, i.e. the right to live in the place where they live, then they, they in particularly can see development in itself. So security of tenure is an important goal in the context of providing housing for low-income communities in itself. But if you look at the speculating processes, the very core of this idea of having security is almost taken away because speculative markets bring about a lot of conflicts and those conflicts lead to a lot of politics over urban space and urban property in itself. And so the paper very much tries to bring this out as to how security of tenure is very fragile in this community in itself, despite the fact that legally, by regulation, most of these communities have a right to those housing in itself. And the third point, which I already talked a bit about, is about that you know infrastructural facilities like water, electricity, um, sanitation, as the infrastructure facilities are put into these slum communities, you also are a threat of security of tenure because as these communities develop or as these spaces develop, these spaces then become rights of other people to capture. And so some of the poorer people cannot live there and so they perhaps are displaced as well. So the question that I've, I looked at in the context of my field work, you know, it's, it's very nice to go back and do field work. You do a lot of field work 
when you do your PhD. And then as you become a lecturer, you do less and less. And so it's always nice as a lecturer to go back and start doing it again and remember what you enjoy doing research with. You know, this, this is the thing that you really value. So it was nice to go back and start interviewing and think about my research and go back to the communities which I had sort of not seen much about much in, in the last few years. So the questions I was looking at was very much looking at this aging population. How do they cope with these slum speculation itself? So the first question was how do what is the effect of individual aging on household dynamics? And how do the household dynamics change because somebody becomes older? And what is that? What does that mean for their own housing and security of tenure? The second question was to explore how the household effects of aging has on the environment of slum speculation. What happens when a person ages? You know, what happens around the person that makes the person uh, really become more vulnerable in itself? And then, of course, looking at some of the diverse strategies that households adopt to cope with these changing circumstances. And so, it went to look at resilience of people in itself and some of the agency that they produce in, in this context. As I was saying, one of, one, one of the things that I hope that this paper really theoretically is based on is on David Harvey's work, and this is the book which is The Limits of Capital, which he published in 1982. And this is the quote which I use a lot in this paper, which is about the increasing tendency to treat the land as a pure financial asset. How does that asset then have a bearing on your life or your, on your household in itself? And of course, the flow <coughs> that he talks about in his talks about financial capital now exerts a profound influence over the production of space and exposes the built environment to different kinds of speculative binges. And that is another thing which, which you know, I'll talk a lot more about as to how it happens. And as I've explained earlier, the land speculation has inflated property values from primary to secondary sources. So we think about speculation in, in land, in the city, in the context of big builders, corporate builders, land grabbing, and so on and so forth. And what we don't look at is how does that affect that on household level in itself. So the paper is very much based on my work in Mumbai. And, um, uh, I've worked a lot in the southern part of the, of, uh, of the city in itself. Um, if, if anybody knows historically, the, the city was seven islands, which then were sort of reclaimed together, and then they sort of joined to the mainland of India in itself. So in some sense, it always runs north to south in itself. The two lines are the two railway lines that go uh, north and south, and which most people commute on. South is Mainz, where the business area used to be, the corporate area used to be, the, sort of the posh parts of Mumbai, and the south, further up with the suburban parts of Mumbai. But as the city has grown, it's grown and expanded and expanded further up, and it's becoming more and more posher and posher as it goes up, and it's becoming more of gated communities and uh, luxury apartments and so on and so forth, and how, how some of the slum dwellers are getting squeezed by these processes in itself. But the field work that I did was very much in the northeast part in, in um, I don't have a uh, pointer, but it, it's, 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 it's not a laser. I'll tell you on the floor, on the world. Behind the wall. <coughs> not a laser, it's oh, a, 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 a real <laughs> Sorry, that's an old fashioned word, yes. yes. Uh, so no. I, I, my work is there in near Govandi, Mankura, near here. Um, um, it, it's a slum which basically uh, was formed in the 1970s and 80s. It's, it's a slum which was on garbage dump. So all the dump of you know, garbage that was collected from the rest of Mumbai was dumped there, which went into the creek. Uh, and, and so uh, you know, people who lived there were people who were, who were very, very poor. And so, you know, we, you know, some people would say, well, there were a lot of Bangladeshi migrants who came and stayed there. But also there were lots of people who were pushed out from the lower part of the city and went and sort of reclaimed that land and lived, lived on it in itself. I have worked with an NGO called Akhale for nearly 20 years. And 
this NGO works in this garbage community. Uh, many of them were garbage co collectors, rat pickers, uh, and so on, but over the period of time, those professions have gone down and there are other places where they were. But the reason I chose this place was because of the floods in 2005. And as you know, Mumbai had, had a torrential rain for about two weeks. And because this place is very much close to the Arabian Sea, or the creek is, uh, this place got flooded. Of course, you know, despite the fact that the land has been reclaimed through garbage pumping, the water did not you know, seep through, and so it remained flooded. And so there were a lot of rehabilitation programs that was started by this particular NGO and, and a lot of relief program of distributing food and supplies and uh, catering to people's uh, needs during these floods. But one of the things that came up with this um, during this period was that this NGO particularly noticed that there were lots of women who lived on their own. And one of the directors of the NGO called Lena Joshi, who's worked with this NGO for you know, nearly 30, 35 years, said to me, oh, you know, one of the things I would like to look is to look at why are these women living on their own? Who are these women? We never noticed them before. Where were they hiding within the sun? So we have no idea in itself. And that really set my curiosity going. And so we started trying to look and identify who these women were. And lo and behold, these were women who were older, widowed, lived on their own, and I, you know, obviously because they were widows, their husbands had died, we lived in very abject poverty. Uh, and so uh, we started, uh, my first thing was to track these people down and then start interviewing them. And this is where this research really began, is to understanding why these women are living on their own, why these widows are living in such abject poverty, and then the story unravels. The other part, other characteristic of this community is that it's a, it's a Muslim community. So it's a very ethnic minority community in India in itself. Um, the, the women that I interviewed, most of them were illiterate, uh, had very limited uh, education, uh, and so could not specifically say what their age were. So you know, there are ways of which way they work their age out. And, the UN, uh, you know, UN has this um, definition that anybody over the age of 60 is, is, is considered as age. Uh, you look around you, people around 60 now look very young. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you know, you know, it is a, a contestable definition of, uh, of aging anyway. Um, but, but within the context of India as well, and within the context of this community, I thought I'd stick to that uh, UN uh, definition of uh, concept of age as 60 and, and, and so try and gauge what these people say. So roughly I got, got age uh, of each and every individual. So I interviewed 53 women over a period of two years. These are long ethnographic interviews, very painful interviews. I spent a lot of time, my time crying listening to the stories that they had to say because it was very emotionally moving. And uh, and the, the, the type of life that they had led was, was very, very um, uh, painful to hear and watch. And uh, <coughs> so this paper has got a lot of memories, uh, has got a lot of um, uh, emotional uh, attachment because it's a story of lots of women and, and their life uh, within slums in Mumbai. So those of you who are thinking of doing dissertations and PhDs and whatnot, um, you know, most of you must have seen my book on doing development research and the various different methodologies. But some of the methodologies that I've used in this research are basically, as I said, in-depth interviews, long interviews, very ethnographic life histories, uh, case study profiles, really going in-depth and looking over a stretch of 60 to 70 years of their life, but also putting it in context as to what was happening in the city as well as what was happening uh, in the context of slums and slum regulation and so on. So, um, you know, newspapers keeping a diary, thinking about my own emotions as while well I was doing uh, this research in itself. But what it does, ethnographic work does, is also it sort of unfolds the social life, it unfolds the characteristics of everyday living 
in Islam in itself? What are the practices? What are the behaviors? What are the attitudes? What are the cultural norms? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are the people's beliefs? You know, how do they view things? And so on and so forth. So it gives you a real insight into the interpretations they have about their lifestyle and how they see it and how they see the world outside from the slums uh, to the other communities in itself. It sort of also clarifies our preconceived ideas and realities. You know, we all have certain assumptions, and I'll come to those assumptions in a minute. But it also gives you an idea of, you know, we have certain ideas of how people live in slums. We have certain perceptions, and perhaps it really brings you into focus that this is not how they see it, and this is not how they feel it. And their feelings and assumptions about it are completely different to ours. And so that's quite a nice thing to sort of keep you in check, you know, because we sometimes forget as academic researchers, we go out there, write our papers, and forget what the reality is back but also, as I said, because I've worked with these communities for a long time, and many of you are starting your careers here, we also realize that you do build a trust and confidence. You know, some people in this community I have known for over 20 years have seen children grow. Children become young youths and getting employed or married and having children. So you see a lot of changes yourself as a researcher by being in that community. That community also becomes part of your life in some sense. You build a lot of confidence and trust with the people who you do research with. I'm fortunate that I can speak several different Indian languages, so, so comfortable to speak in different languages it always helps. And so didn't have to use translators and didn't understand how to use um, you know, understand some of the nuances that take place, some of the ways in which people talk about certain things, and of course, behavioral observation and fieldwork becomes very useful. So that was a short mini lesson for you on how to do fieldwork, mm -hmm. if you haven't really looked at it so far. Anyway, talking about the city of Mumbai in itself, it's a city of two halves. It's a city, as I said, you know, the, the picture at the top, is what is called the Queen's Necklace, a very posh part of India, like Manhattan in New York. You know, it's, it has these nice skyscrapers, gated communities, uh, posh apartments. You, know, you could live anywhere in this world. You could be there and you could be any part of any part of Europe in itself. So it's a wealthy city in India. It has the highest GDP of any city in South or Central Asia. It has 54% of Mumbai slums who live in the slums, which are, that's the picture of the Haravi, the aerial view. Um, you know, and and it, it, it's, it sort of shows you the density of population in itself. If you ever go to Mumbai, don't forget to have a trip around the Haravi. There's a tourist bureau in the Haravi. They take you around to show you what the Haravi is like. It's quite interesting. It's worth going and seeing it if you ever do. Um, and there are 25 to 30% of people who live in chawls and pavements. There are still people who live on streets in itself. And 67% of people work in informal sectors. So, you know, have lots of different industries within slums. Like Dharavi has a lot of leather goods. If you're using a lot of leather purses, uh, wallets, shoes, quite a lot of them come from places like uh, like slum in Dharavi. And Mumbai still believes that there are people who find Mumbai as a very glamorous city and people still migrate to it and think that this is a place where they make money. And so you still have 200 to 300 families who arrive in Mumbai every day. Now, because I'm going to talk about aging, I thought I should put a slide on what the census talks about aging within India. So, you know, of course, like everywhere in the world, demographic transition has taken place. Demographic transition means that people are living longer because we have better health services than we had before. We don't have any of those diseases which wipe populations. We don't have cholera and so on, which, which really wipe the different types of population. So the average life expectancy at birth has increased in itself. So in India, we still have 68, 68.8 uh, years uh, as a life expectancy. If you look around Europe, it's about beyond 80 and such. You know. so, so it's still relatively low, but still relatively high in the Indian context in itself. 
From all the biggest change that the 2011 census has noticed, that people are living <coughs> longer beyond 80 as well, which didn't happen a lot in all. So lots of people living over the 80. I was reading an interesting article a few years ago, and um, the Queen in England was saying she is upset because she has to now sign so many <coughs> cards because there's so many people who turn 100. You know, initially, when she first became the queen, she only wrote one or maybe two cards a year. Now she really has to write something like 100, 150 cards a year. So it just shows that there are 100, 150 people living over the age of 100 who receive a card from the queen. You know, and that, that's, that's, the, that's the tradition in England. In London and so I thought, oh, well, I did feel very sorry for the queen. <laughs> 150 cards in the year. Um, so anyway, but it just puts things in context. You know, you're all living longer. Uh, you know, in, in Europe and places, you're living more than 100 years. I think the longest woman, the, the, the oldest woman, died last year. We lived 114 years. Um, and so, so you know, we are, we are. And especially the other part of the story is that women are living longer than men. So all women around you not good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it does make it, it a, 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 an interesting issue here also within India, where women are living longer, life expectancy is more longer, and that means more women are living as widows and in poverty. And what does that mean for development in itself? It's a big developmental challenge that is coming on the scene. And of course, most of these women are also living on their own. So that, that puts another light to what, what we're talking about poverty. We talk about poverty, and this is again about measurements of poverty. People who do development will probably, you know, we've always talked about poverty. We talked about poverty in the context of income. We talked about poverty in the context of assets. We talked about livelihoods. But we've never talked about, uh, about um, um, poverty in the context of our emotions, about our livelihoods, in the context of how we see our lifespan. Because we never had that longevity in the, in, in the development context of itself. But now, everywhere, I mean, every developing world today, people are living longer. What does that mean in the context of poverty as, as you age? If you don't have universal pension rights, you don't have social security benefits, you rely on what does it mean to, live, to be old and, and live in poverty in itself? So the Indian census particularly has come out and said that nearly 30% of people live below the poverty line, which is $2 a day. Um, and, and so, you know, 90% of people have to work even as they age. So there are papers now coming out. Uh, there was a paper recently from Sri Lanka where people in their 80s were working because they don't have no other livelihoods to live on and, and no other income to live on. So um, coming back to Mumbai, <laughs> from looking at this transition in itself, is about some of the socioeconomic indicators of the sample that I have for the people whom I interview. Of course, predominantly the women were between the age of 60 and 70. Uh, most of them were widows. Most of them had had, on average, six children. Some even more. Some had 10, 11. And part of that story is a lot of people lost their children on the way because they lived in abject poverty, in the unhygienic conditions that they lived in. The survival rates of their children was also there. There's also a lot of interesting stories, but sad stories in the context of how they have lost their little girls, girls who have disappeared from their, from their households. Why, where they went, which they can never tell. So there's lots of those stories of you know, all sorts of sexual abuse, you know, people who have to do have lost, lost their children over a period of time for various different reasons in itself. All of them were migrants to Mumbai. They came in, in when they were in young, when they, when they were in their 20s, uh, either as a married or either with their families in itself. So various part, mainly from north of India, particularly the state of Uttar Pradesh in itself. On average, most of them had lived in the slum, which I researched on for nearly 30 years. So, if you think about it, if you lived there for 30 years, legally by right, according to the Indian government, you have the right to live in there. You, know, you have the security, you have what they call as a photo pass, which is like an identity passport sort of 
of a, a document which gives you the right to stay there. Nobody can demolish your hut. You have a legal right to stay there and exit. And of course, 90% of the people whom I interviewed were owners. They owned that little patch of land and that little hut that they lived in. And also, 95% of these women had ration cards. As you know, in India, we still have a system of ration cards, which basically entitles you to get um, um, you know, basic things like uh, wheat and rice uh, and kerosene, uh, sugar, uh, and, and, and sometimes a few other things, but very, very rarely do you get any other things. But for that, you have to qualify that you are living below the poverty line. And so then it, you, it doesn't mean that it is free, but it is in a subsidized rate in itself. And as I said earlier, most of these women had poor literacy levels. Okay, so if you're looking at this, and this is something coming back to what I was saying earlier about assumptions. So this is about assumptions. One of the biggest assumptions we have about people living in cities is that once people have migrated, they have earned their living, once they are old, they go back to their rural areas. And we believe that. All urban geographers, all urban people who have worked in the cities feel, oh yes, when they come young, they work in the informal sector, they work really hard, make their money, and then they go home. But if you ask all these widows of mine, or all these people, what is there to go back home? There is no home left. So there is no, none of this a rural to urban migration. I mean, I remember as an undergraduate listening to Michael Lipton, who wrote this book called Why Poor People Stay Poor. And he would talk about the seasonal migration, how people, you know, farm and then they would go to the cities, work when there is no farming, come back from the cities, go back to rural areas. That doesn't happen anymore. So again, we have all these assumptions that this is some of the processes that are taking place. But people who have migrated to the city stay in the city, die in the city. And that's one of the assumptions that we have to really question on in urban processes. That we somehow believe that somehow these cities will somehow you know, reduce the population by people going back to village back and so on and so on. In the Indian context, we also believe that because we come from a very Hindu culture or Muslim culture or whatever, that we have this very family orientation, and we value our family, and so on, and so we think our elderly live with us. So we have this have this ratio of thinking that oh yes, your children will look after your you know, your um, your um, grandparents and your parents and so on and so forth. And 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 again, that assumption. If you look at my sample, you know, very few people live with their children anymore. Children migrate as well, and children go and live somewhere else. There isn't any space. There's more and more nuclear households. So even in very traditional Hindu or Muslim setup, that whole cultural, social change has taken place. That you know, families don't live together in itself. All people who talk about displacement or talk about people who have been evicted from slum communities, or even if you look at corporate sector developers who talk about people who say, oh, well, they are not owners of that land, or they are not owners of those properties, or they are not owners of those huts. But if you look at the sample that I am looking at, everybody is an owner. Most of the people who are displaced have legal right to ownership to those huts as well and to the places and stuff. So again, we have an assumption, a widespread assumption, that because they are owner occupant, they are secure, that they have a security of tenure. And again, that assumption is very much again contested in today's urban living itself. And the final assumption we have that is because everybody is an owner, everybody owns their houses, nobody lives on rent. Yet, even within slum communities, there is a big landlord-tenant relationship that goes on, and there is a huge amount of rental processes. So where are the owners then? If somebody is renting them, where is the owner living? So there is again, we are again assuming the slum communities are communities which are owned by people, people live there. But it isn't maybe these slums are not owned by the people who live there, it's owned by somebody else who is perhaps speculating to as well. So some of these assumptions are the ones which we need in this paper contests. Is they said that we find these households are not, not really households uh, that are as we see them. 
Um, and again, you know, household dynamics uh, change. And again, this is something I was talking about, the preconceived realities we have, you know, about you know, that um, a lot of the parents live because in the Indian tradition or in many traditional setups, you think you move to your husband's house, you stay in your husband's house, and you live with your husband's parents. That is very much on decline. Nowhere in South Asia now, it's, if you go around in many of the slum communities, that is not happening in itself. The role of the carer and the care for also changes over life. And because I was interviewing a lot of widows, these are the women who have been daughter-in-laws and now are mother-in-laws. So they have changed their reversal of a role. And what does that bring, how the gender power relationship within a household change? And what is the implications of those household changes and life cycles on their life in itself as they live in their life? And again, that dynamics is something which is very important. Again, here I finally come to another assumption. But we always assume that it's a very happy family who likes to live together in itself. But the stories of these women in itself highlights how much of abuse that takes place, either verbally, physically, or emotionally, within households as well as so the elderly itself. Despite the fact that we have a huge tradition in India of respecting our elders, that's necessarily not the case in itself. So, I'm hoping one day I will be able to write a paper on gender and widowhood <laughs> when I get a time. And so this is, this is a story I'd like to talk about in my research about, you know, part of the speculation story is about what widowhood in contemporary India is like. Widowhood in contemporary India is not very really nice to look at. It's a very painful process and it's a very painful for women who undergo, especially people who live in poverty. A lot of the women I interviewed, of course, some of them were increasingly uh, uh, you know, towards, coming towards their 80s in itself, more pronounced amongst women. And it was interesting, there were very few men whom I could interview, partly because I couldn't find them. You know, I could find a lot of women, older women, but couldn't find a lot of men. Again, that's the story going back to demographic transition and life expectancy in itself. So what are the things that these women did? And most of them worked from home. Um, you know, you see a lot of this embroidery work, and this particular community is very good at doing this badla jelly work. They do a lot of this little embroidery work around collars, thing. Shirts, Marks and Spencer's shirts in London, very much, you know, sewing buttons. You get, you know, five rupees for per shirt, five buttons, and so on. So you do a lot of day piecemeal jobs. Um, you do work on construction sites, even though you're old. And as you're old, again, those sorts of jobs become less. Domestic working, again, as their eyesight is deteriorating physically, they're becoming weaker. They're losing those sort of manual jobs in itself. And also, some of them are begging on the street. So begging is also a part of the profession in itself. I talked about illiteracy, low education level, because these were women who moved from rural areas to urban areas never got educated in itself. Uh, three out of the five single <coughs> women, um, you know, <coughs> are very poor in the Indian census, but in, in my study, nearly everybody was very, very poor. Uh, very much living. But if you ask them what did they eat, let's say I had a chai and a pao, which is a, a, which is a bread roll and a, and a cup of tea. What did you, when was your last meal? A last meal was something that a neighbor gave them leftover food and so on and so forth. So a lot of these women not only live on their own, but they are also very malnutrited. Uh, they have very little to eat, nutritive food to eat in itself. So physically they are weak. Uh, mentally also and emotionally they are quite weak because they live on their own. Loneliness, mental illness, uh, family issues in itself are also quite high on their, on their agenda. In so in many ways, emotionally they are very vulnerable. Uh, their social networks are good to support each other. Um, they, they sort of take care of each other. Uh, there is no question of retirement. These people are working in their 80s. And it's, so again, this again goes back to the issue of Millennium Development Goals. And in thinking about how do you view poverty you know, and the different dimensions of poverty. And again, I've just taken that quote out of the Millennium Development Goals, which talks about Dimensions of poverty that go beyond income and livelihoods to incorporate concerns such as security of tenure. 
And these widows are the first people who are much more vulnerable in the speculation of land in itself. So a lot of these women get harassed a lot. Yeah? Because they live on their own, because they have nobody to look after themselves, they have a lot of things that where, where people are waiting for them to die. People are waiting to grab that little piece of land that they live on. People are waiting for them to be booted out so that they can so that they can just capture it and claim it as their own in itself. So here I have a few quotes that I've put in from my field work. So the first one is where this in this particular interview the woman says, I had gone home because my parents died, which is to her rural area. When I was gone, someone took my hut, didn't give my ration card also. And so they took all her possessions, all her legal papers, and they basically shoved her out of her house and took over. So, you know, because it's speculation, because that land is, is important, there is a lot, even your neighbors, that you don't have to trust, you can't trust. I don't have a house, my husband died, I lived with my in-laws, they broke my heart and they threw me out. So she was a daughter-in-law, she's now her husband's died, she's a widow, she's living on her own. So other family members have taken over her hut and thrown her out on the streets and it's a third example, no, don't take debt because can't pay it back. So I've never taken debt. I mean, don't bother building a house because they just break into it. This is in Baba Nagar where she lived. It is. We did take a loan for rupees 6,000 to build, but then they came and they broke it all. So what is the point? So they don't want to invest in doing the houses up properly as well. Because if they do, they know that there are other people who are always waiting to take those in. Although we have been living here for so long, we have a ration card, a voting card, you know, which is all the different legal documents in itself. Despite the fact that because she's living on her own, she's getting harassed, bullied by people around her in itself, so that she can vacate that little space in itself. And the fourth example I have here is, my husband, when he used to work in the market, he had a room and a machi shop, a machi shop and a fish shop. Even before I was married, his people, they got him to sign papers and told him that they swore in the Quran they weren't taking his room and he was alone. Then threw him out. And I've translated it word by word, that's why the English is the way it is. Uh, he was an only child, he was a simple man, he took it, his nephew asked him for it and got him to give it to them. So again, there's a lot of coercion even within families, so there's a lot of bullying that goes on within families. And then the final one I've put there is fires. And fires seem to not just happen within India. I've now got experiences of places even in Pakistan and Bangladesh itself, where both of the NGOs that I've worked with have said, overnight fires take place in slums. And suddenly a whole batch of land is, is cleared out. Why? Because it's a land which is either next to a street, a developer is interested in it, and so on and so forth. So there is a different ways in which silent eviction takes place. So in the past, you know, you had bulldozers who went in because the government had land and people were displaced. But now you cannot even trust your own neighbors in itself. So there's a lot of fragmentation within communities in itself. There's a lot of speculation on that land and it's everybody is eyeing that land, that prime land that you live on. And because you are poor and because you cannot protect yourself, you are perhaps more vulnerable and more likely to be displaced in this urban speculative business in itself. And fires is one way of doing it. I mean, practical action, for example, has had a lot of these uh, in, in, uh, in, in Pakistan that they've had to cope with. So um, that is one part of the story of where harassment takes place. You know, I mean, I mean, there's women who are telling me you know, that people would come and defecate around her house because they wanted to make her life miserable so that she would leave and so on and so forth. So there are different ways in which there is a mental torture taking place for these people. And debt to repayment is one as well. But people have borrowed either because of ill health or borrowed to pay for weddings or for things that have happened to them in itself. And because they've borrowed, the people whom they have borrowed it from, people whom they trusted borrowed, have captured their land as part of debt repayment in itself. So I'm not going to go into this slide because I, I can see I'm running out of time uh, in itself. So again, you know, people can get displaced because of of, um, 
of, uh, of um, debt relief payment and etc. Again, various interviews, again, just showing how infrastructure services, like as water and, and sanitation facilities have been introduced, the rent market goes up. So, so people who are landlords will probably start charging rent because suddenly you've got water 24 hours, or you've got a water supply, or you've got toilets, or you've got electricity. And so suddenly this, this property, which was costing maybe just, you know, 2,000 rupees a month, suddenly becomes 4,000 rupees a month. And so the person who was living in that house has to be moved because they can't particularly afford that anymore. So despite the fact, and there is a huge problem here for charitable NGOs. Um, NGOs who are doing, putting services because of their benevolent nature of charities, wanting to get better environment and a better livelihood for these people, yet they are seeing the consequences of introducing this infrastructure can make insecurity for people who live there, so the people can be displaced. So again, there is an issue here, there is a biggest dilemma for NGOs like water aid and, um, and, uh, and, and practical action who do put infrastructure. Now this is, a, is an interesting story. Okay, I've concentrated on a lot of doom and gloom that's happened, but this is a story of upward mobility. So here is one of my widows who has captured the slum speculation. So she has made something good out of it. So she said, oh no, my mother got this house. We poor, poor, we bought it for 5,000 rupees. First bought a hut 30, 40 years ago. Then 30, 40 years ago, uh, you go and get it for another 5,000. We bought another house. So she's bought another house for another 5,000. That was not well made, then slowly added to that, so she, you know, it was a plastic or whatever. She's now made it into a nice brick house. Then sold it, bought another one at a profit, then lived in it for a while, then sold it for another profit, and bought another one. So this woman is now owning almost about 10 to 15 different hutties round in, in the summer. So she has speculated. She has speculated like every one of us would in, in, in her context and bought every hut for 5,000 rupees each time and built on it and so on. So she has a, is a very good example of upward mobility. So even within slums, why should we not expect some of these processes to take place? Okay, so upward mobility is, and so she has managed to move up and up and up. So to come towards the end of, of the paper is that there are various projects that are taking place. You know, there's cross-subsidization of housing projects and so on. But what is happening is that we are making more and more poor people vulnerable. Despite the fact legally people have tenure, the speculation that is happening within slums means that because of land prices around in the city are changing, because the dynamics of political economy of the city is changing, it is having a negative impact on poorer people in itself. So as rising land values increase, the likelihood of tenants being evicted is even higher. So you know, the more services you provide, the more likelihood of eviction. The more the, the city come, becomes bigger and bigger, or certain areas become more lucrative, and corporate industries are more and more interested in building luxury apartments, the future generation have got less and less secure places to live in and stuff. So it goes back to, Something like Alan Gilbert's, whose work I used to look at when I was an undergraduate in itself. And he used to say, well, the best thing would be to have rental housing. And I think it's the best option for the urban poor, rather than being owners in itself. So again, we're going back to the 70s. So coming back to David Harvey again here. So what David Harvey is also saying is that what we need to look at is look at the sub-markets that are happening in this country. We need to look at the diversity of housing sub-markets. Clearly a definitive story of production of space. How production of urban space is being negotiated within the city boundary is an interesting one in itself. We always talk about the upper class and the middle class, but what we don't talk about is the emerging classes and the politics of how they are exploiting the city. Emerging class that explored the needs to switch the capital of the primary to the secondary. So the secondary capital which is moving, so what is happening in the city is very much with the prime finances that is taking place. But those prime finances 
are also having consequences on the secondary uh, issues in itself. So what we need to really look at the new powers, the new social powers that are emerging in uh, the global slums in itself, and also articulate the disempowerment that is taking place, you know, how people are dispossessed and disempowered, and how the processes of gentrification are actually marginalizing and excluding the poor in itself. So of course, there's two dimensions to this paper. One is the aging story, and of course the aging story which talks about the vicious circles of poverty that these women have gone through throughout their life. And so the visibility of aging is also important as to how these are the forgotten people and the most under-researched people within cities. We concentrate a lot on the young. We think about employment. We think about call centers in Mumbai. We think about the different types of industries we want for the young, how we can build about skilled labors in the IT industry. But what we're not looking at what is what do we do with this aging population? How do we make it economically productive? How do we make it much more of a happy population in itself? We're not looking at the links between aging and poverty. Because there is no social security benefits in many developing countries, including India, there's no universal pension rights, so these people are living more and more in poverty in itself. But also the feminization of poverty. Now, as I said, gender, widowhood is the biggest thing that is a challenge that we're going to face. The more women will live longer, the more women will live longer, the more women will live in poverty, and the more they live in poverty longer in itself. In itself. So we need to think about the multidimensional aspects of poverty. Again, going back to David Harvey, the rights to the city. You know, who has the right to the city? You know, we do not honor the dignities of the poor people. We do not honor the dignities of the aged people. So who is the city for? Perhaps the cities have become very unfriendly places for changing households. What do the household dynamics mean? You know, what, how do we transform these dynamics into the politics of marginalization and discrimination that is taking place in this? And of course, you know, as we are titling, as we you know, talk about more about ownerships and land possessions and so on, and the more gentrification takes <coughs> place, the more we are talking about dispossession and disempowerment as well. And of course, you know, one of the other things that has happened within India, if you look at the urbanization process, people are getting shifted further and further away. So people are commuting further and further away as well. But also, there are these urban corridors that are being formed. So you have the urban corridor between Bombay and Pune, or you have the you know, Mumbai Pune corridor. Or you have the corridor between, say, Delhi and, and Noida, you know, going out in, 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 in India in itself. Or if you go to Kenya, you go out from Na Nairobi to Nakuru, and there's this whole urban corridor. So the, the city sprawls out, and these are the poor people who are continuously being shifted and shifted and shifted out in itself, but still, but still sort of servicing the city in itself. So as the urban fringes get, get more and more regularized and so on and so forth, you find generally the house prices keep increasing and increasing. And so the next generation of poorer people will never be able to buy, you know, or never be able to live in a city in itself. So it, it really is is talking about the urban corridors and how that is that is taking place. And so the final slide that I wanted to talk about is in the context of the politics. <coughs> The urban politics is completely different to what we were used to. It wasn't about the poor and the rich anymore. It is the politics within the poor in itself. So that's the politics that we really need to look at. New actors who are competing for power within the Islam communities in itself. The new configurations of inequality. You know, no slum community is a homogeneous community. There's a huge amount of stratification within slums in itself. Uh, so there's a new forms of marginal marginality, but also new forms of exclusion that are taking place in itself. What it highlights is that there is growing fragmentation. As there is fragmentation, there is more influence, there is more power, there is more decision making. So decisions about slums are not taken by slum communities, but somebody who's completely different. These are landlords, people who don't live there people who are renting these places out in itself. So it is a difficulty in, in trying to understand the consensus within slums in itself. 
What we really need to understand is the changing landscape. What the changing landscape means and how the politics of Indian city has changed and how that is the political economy of urban real estate. And that's something we haven't really looked at. Is how these real estates are really changing the dynamics of urban politics. Thank you. Urbanization trends in in southern economies, mm -hmm. and and one of the theories that we, we teach here and we learn here is that it has um, urbanization or urban centers have grown as a consequence of agricultural productivity. Right. So we basically seeing Western uh, economies how uh, urban areas have grown here, we think that this is the model for the rest of the world. So. I would like you to tell us a little why people is moving here to urban areas, why urbanization is taking place, if it's a consequence of good agricultural productivity, or if it's something else. Um, it's, it's an interesting question, because why people move is, is always sort of fascinated us since the 1960s. You know, people migrate, migrate for various different reasons. But one of the predominant reasons within India particularly is, is about division of land. You know, people didn't own their lands or you know, tilted other people's lands. So as people became more and more mechanized in their farming processes, uh, these people who tilted their lands were also moved out in some sense, squeezed out of those processes, or pushed out of their agriculture processes because of mechanization itself. But also because of um, as productivity, agriculture productivity grew, you know, you found that the intensity of which the way it was produced <coughs> meant that there were so many laborers were not needed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from not only just mechanization, but also about you know people who owned the owned those you know sort of generations who owned you know so some family members stayed back and looked after the land, well as other family members. There wasn't much to do for them, moved to the city in itself, and in some sense also passed on remittance. <clears throat> I mean, in this particular slum, there is another story of migration, which I haven't talked much in this paper, and this is about people going and working on construction sites in Dubai. Mm -hmm. So as Dubai as a city was booming, a lot of the people from Mumbai went across <laughs> to Dubai and worked there as you know, as laborers on various industries in the construction industry in particular so, and bought it a lot of money back, which also helps speculation. But so also migration is, is, is a core issue as to why people move. Of course, people think the grass is greener on the other side, there are better job opportunities, um, there are more ways of mo making money. Uh, young people, you know, like the glitter of the city that's still in a, in existence. Uh, youths from India, particularly, you know, we have a you know the demographic transition both in India and China is similar. In one sense, we've got this 10% now aging population, but we've also got 25% of young population who need jobs. And the economy is not creating jobs for these people who are not highly skilled for the changing economy in itself. So you've got IT industries who can employ lots of people as well, but they are very skilled laborers. What happens to the people who are not that skilled? And what do you do with these, with these people who have come from rural areas who, who perhaps do not have the skills for the changing economy? 
So they have to find jobs. And they are the ones who are also migrating from rural areas to, to urban areas. So the city, in some sense, is the city of hope mm -hmm. uh, in, for many people still. And people hope to find that there are different ways in which they can earn an income which they have none of those potentials in rural areas. Mm -hmm. I think that, that I hope that answers your question. Because I think migration is, but you know, there is global care chains. I mean, the, the idea in general is that we move out of the agriculture sector because there are jobs in the industrial sector. But the point in many, that shows many slums, is that actually they go to the cities and that's not the case. Yes. The people have been displaced from rural areas. But and also industrial processes are not existing in all countries. Even in exactly. Latin America, it's because more the service yeah. industries mm -hmm. that they are working in. I need to have education for that. For for that, that and so on. And that. But the other part of the migration story, and this is something because I'm interested in aging, if you look at Japan, what's happening in Japan at the moment, you know, they don't have many people to look after their elderly. So they are importing all the Filipinos and the Indonesians and so on as workers to care for their elderly. Mm -hmm. And the people in Japan who cannot uh, afford to have these care workers are migrating to Indonesia and Philippines because that's where they will get cheaper services. So the global care chain is also an interesting aspect of migration in itself. So, you know, so from people like from Mexico, for example, going into the U.S. to work as nannies or whatever, is the same story, where people are, you know, there aren't many of those workers. You know, what's happening in England at the moment as well, there's not many people to do the casual labor, you know, the, the, the low-skilled jobs. You know, so. And so, you know, though we have this whole, I mean, we've just had an election in, in the U.K. and immigration is the biggest, you know, issue. But the immigration can be any biggest issue in Europe, but it needs that casual labor. And where does that casual labor come from? It comes from these economic migrants. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no, none of those people are available to do that. So migration is, an all, is always going to be an interesting story. You can look at it from various dimensions, either rural, agricultural, you can look at it from aging and global care chains, or you can look at it in the aspects of industry versus agriculture productivity, migration still will remain, and it has been for generations. Thank you, it was very interesting to listen about the perspective of the gender widowhood. And I'd like to ask you if you can say something more about the, what is the situation of the young generation in the slums. Young women? Yes. Uh, like children also as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, young women, I mean, in Mumbai particularly, uh, is young women work a lot in government industries. You know, government industries proliferated in the 90s because they all supplied, you know, you got cheap t shirts and shirts <laughs> here, and those cheap t shirts and shirts were made in South Asia. So, Bangladesh and India particularly made a lot of garment industries. Uh, in which many young girls work for long shifts. And I don't know if you have ever heard of Darren Ielsen, who wrote this book on feminization of the labor market. And, and, the f and, and this is all about how young girls work long shifts for 12 hours in these sort of export-oriented industries in itself. The other story, I mean, yeah, the other funny story of this is also about young girls, in, I mean, you know, because I've been working in slums for a long period of time, Young girls no longer want to work as domestic work meals in, in households. You know, their mothers may have worked, but they don't want to work as domestic maids and so on and so forth. They want to work in industries. They want to work, you know, in either call centers. You know. So the story in Slumdog Millionaire, in some sense, where he learns, I don't know if you ever remember that film, where he's learning to speak English. Mm -hmm. So you see these adverts everywhere about young girls and boys wanting to speak good English. So, so there's another film that you should watch if you haven't watched it. Is the uh, Marigold Hotel? Has anybody watched that? Yeah, in Marigold Hotel, the, the lady, the, the aging lady here from the UK goes and lives in India. And her job is to teach people from slums how to speak proper English so that they can answer your, 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 your calls, your calls that, uh, 
that you get for various things that are sold. So it, it's an interesting story in itself. But the young girls are aspirational. You know, they aspire for more. Um, there is this interesting article by Susan Loke who wrote, not for money but for lipstick. You know, they want to live a glamorous life too, and so they'd rather go, they'd work but go and buy a lipstick because they'd like to have a lipstick. So again, you know, aspirations and expectations are very hard. Um, when you live in a city, you know, you are watching these things unfold on television, unfold in the city, and you aspire for the type of clothes to wear, for the lifestyles and so on. <coughs> and actually, if you look, women are very resilient in that sense, and young girls particularly are very aspirational as to what they want for themselves, for their families, for their children, and so on. So there is, there is quite a lot of... Um, energetic enthusiasm. Uh, the, the only issue with that enthusiasm is about um, are there any, you know, enough opportunities to make that into a success. And it's a challenge not just for India particularly, it's a challenge for a lot of Asian economies. That you know, we can talk about the aging population but there's also a huge amount of young population who are educated, unemployed young population who do need their energies and their aspirations to be geared towards something which can fruitfully you know, develop into something new and exciting and, and, and have a fabulous life. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and like anybody around in Europe or in anywhere else has aspirations and expectations out of their life is the same in many slums. Too. Can I make a question in relation to this? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, because I was thinking when you say that uh, women are, are the poorest, um, I was thinking this is more like a cultural aspect, it's not related to capitalism in itself, mm -hmm. but how it's translated in this particular country where women have no access to education or the labor market. But now with the feminization of the labor market that also we see in Latin America. Mm -hmm. You think that in the future it will change that women will be alone and the poor? For the poor? Well, I think part of also is that because there is um, again the assumption that we have a support system. You know, women particularly like to believe you have a support system. But the more the stories that I get is that as you get older the, the lonelier you become. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, as I become older, I, I, I realize you have less and less friends too. You know, so, so you, you, you do, you do, and, and it, it is not it is not something that just happens in developing countries. It happens here too. I mean, loneliness is the biggest killer of aging population. You know, you talk to any help age you know, charities, you know, mental illness and loneliness. Uh, in my street where I live in London, you know, it, it's a street which is an old community. About 30 to 40 percent of the houses are only women living on their own. You know, their husbands have died. Mm -hmm. They have a property. They live on their own. You know, and it, it is. You you wonder what their lifestyle is like. Mm -hmm. you know, they live in my neighborhood. I go off to work every morning and come back in the evening. I don't have the time to talk to them. You know, they were very nice to my children when my children were born and so on and so forth. But again, it is. It's, it's a story everywhere. It's not a story just in the UK or just in, within India. Or, you know, it's a story throughout the world. And part of this whole thing about as we live longer, we need to be thinking about what is it that we do when we are 60 plus or 70 plus. And how do you look at that lifestyle? You know, what do you want to be? Do you want to be an economically productive? You know, we cannot look at the aging population like we saw our grandparents. We perhaps need to look at the aging population in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's where we need to start thinking <laughs> as to what is it that, that you do. Yeah. Well, I want to first of all thank you for an amazing lecture. I'm following a story from my phone, uh, but um, I want to, to ask, like, has there been then some kind of grouping amongst those ladies that uh, 
you know, like for example, in some older communities, or some an older that you get together and you try to do some kind of activities. Mm. So have there been something like that that they get together and they maybe talk, or is it been? Yeah. It's happening. It's yeah. happening. I mean, as I said, you know, earlier, there are networks, there are social networks, and because these women are living in poverty. There is a lot of issues of day-to-day -day survival. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's feeding each other, looking after each other when somebody is ill, those sorts of social network. And uh, I don't know if you know, you've done issues on social capital in your in your work. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is about building that social capital in communities in itself. And they rely on that social capital. It's not the money that they rely on so much. They have very little money. But because some neighbor comes in and feeds them or gives them a leftover or somebody takes you to the hospital when you're in, that sort of social network is very much valued and that is the social capital that they have. It's not, they don't aspire for huge amounts of money, but they aspire for a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think that, that comes across a lot in the uh, it isn't about wanting nice clothes or fancy food to eat or living in a palatial place. It is about you know, surviving in a much more comfortable way, in a much more happier environment. And I, and I, I think you know, that's, that's the thing that, that they will look for. But um, to answer also your question, yes, in, in middle class, I don't know if you've heard about the laughing clubs. Uh, this is very popular in, in, in Mumbai, particularly. A lot of people go to the seasides and or go to open spaces in the morning, especially elderly people, and they laugh. Have you tried it? <laughs> it's one of the things that if you, if you start your day with laughing, it's called the laughing club. And there, there are lots of laughing clubs and walking clubs and stuff like that, which elderly people do, even in urban areas and in itself. And the laughing clubs are really popular. The part of it is you start the day not thinking of sad things, but thinking about happiness. You share a joke, you share, or you just laugh. And then that makes the day go better. So I, 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 there are lots of things that could be done, should be done. But again, it's, it's not the 